plug. Uh, my name is Michael Rennie. I'm president of the University Exeter Freedom Society. We believe in free speech, freedom of market, and freedom of religion. Every Thursday, we meet in old timers. If you want to come along and support the cause of freedom, come and join us. I'm very pleased to be able to talk about uh, this with you today and to share our message. With us, we have Yaron Brook of the Ayn Rand Institute. He's an entrepreneur, and a fantastic speaker, and a very loyal friend of our society. Without further ado, everyone, a round of applause, please. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's a real pleasure to be back at Exeter. I think this is my fifth time. I've been here every year for the last five years. Uh, two of my uh, most popular videos ever were, were taken right here, maybe even in this classroom, or, or in, I know in this building. So uh, thank you to Exeter for, uh, for being so hospitable towards me over the last few years. I want to talk today about maybe the most important question that each one of us as an individual must ask himself. That is, what is the purpose of life? What should you live for? Whom should you live for? What is life for? And we get lots of different answers from all over the place. We get those who tell us there's some greater meaning, some greater purpose for which we should live for. Whether it's religion and there's a God that we should live for and sacrifice our love, I love for. Whether it's a community, whether it's a state. I grew up, as I think many of you know, I grew up in Israel. And I was taught that my purpose was to sacrifice for the sake of the state, that the state was more important than me, that the tribe, the tribe I happened to be born accidentally into, the Jewish tribe, was more important than me as an individual. And I grew up committed to this idea. I, was, I, I, I like to say I was waiting for the grenade so I could jump on it, right, and sacrifice my life for this greater good, for this higher cause. Luckily for me, I think, I read Atlas Shrugged at the age of 18, uh, 16 and got dissuaded from that idea. Because one of the questions one must always ask of any claim that people make about anything is the most basic question. And that question is, why? Why is this group's life more important than mine? Why is the state more important than the individual? Why? Is my life less important to me than your life? And this is a question that is that we get no answers for. People say, because. Because we're told by some higher authority that that's the way it's supposed to be. But there is no in reason, there is no rational explanation by which the lives of the group or the lives of someone else is more important to you than your own life. But our entire moral code in the West for 2,000 plus years has been rooted in the idea that what makes you moral, what makes you good, what makes you noble is to sacrifice yourself. It's to be selfless. It's always to consider the interest of others above your interests of your own life. Ayn Rand challenged that idea for me in Atlas Shrugged, and I hope everybody here reads that book. It's a, it's a life changer. Or at the very least, it causes you to think. Uh, you know, I guess God forbid, but, you know, causes you to think about the world, which is, I believe, a, a healthy exercise for anybody. Agree or disagree. Challenge your beliefs. And the best way to challenge them I think, is to read Ayn Rand. But I want to today challenge this idea. And really, instead of focusing on the negative and what you shouldn't do, I want to challenge the idea that that is the only option in ethics, the only option in morality, the only option of living a good life is to be selfless. It's to sacrifice. It's to live for the sake of other people. We have, uh, Ayn Rand wrote a book called The Virtue of Selfishness. Now, selfishness has a really negative connotation. In all of our minds, when I say selfish, what pops into the mind? What's the first thing? 
that one thinks of when you talk about selfish. Three. What's that? Three. Greed, right? But what is greed? Irresponsible. Irresponsible. What else? So when I point at somebody in the schoolyard and say, ooh, that kid's selfish. Do I mean that kid takes care of himself? What do I mean, usually? Yeah. Uh, like a, I don't know how to put it. Like, excuse my phrase, but he's a bit of a twat to everyone else. <laughs> yeah, he's a twat to everybody else. Twat is a word I've never used in my life. But, uh, <laughs> but I think that captures the idea, right? It means that he is willing to exploit other people, to be nasty, to, to do whatever it takes to get his way. That's how we've been conditioned to think about the idea of self-interest, about the idea of selfishness, about the idea of egoism. He thinks of himself first and as a consequence is willing to exploit other people, to lie, steal, cheat, stab people in the back, whatever it takes to get his way. There's a sense in which in ethics we're offered two alternatives of human behavior. One is good, and it means to sacrifice, to think of others first, to be selfless. The other is be, to be a lying, cheating, stealing twat. <laughs> I was going to be SOB, but twat sounds like a good word right, for this. Really? That's it? So what Ayn Rand does is she challenges that idea. She asks the question, why should I live for others? And then she says, well, what would, would it mean to live for yourself? What would it mean to be selfish if selfish just meant taking care of self, living for oneself, placing one's own values ahead of the values of others or first in one's own pursuit of life? Would that actually lead to being all those descriptors we had before, so we don't have to repeat them, right? Would that actually meet, lead to that behavior? So the first point she makes is, your life is yours. If you choose to live, if you choose to be alive, if you choose to survive, what is required of you? What do you need to pursue? What do you need to do if you want to live, to survive? Right, what's the first thing human beings need to do if they want to live? They want to survive. Yeah. Eat. Eat is great. How do we eat? Where does food come from? Now, don't say the supermarket, please. <laughs> I've had people say the supermarket. Where, where does food come from? For human beings, like, like other animals, how do other animals get food? Right? They, if, if you're a, a, a tiger, you chase it down and you eat it. Uh, you know, if you're a zebra, I guess, you eat leaves. Uh, if you're a horse, you eat grass. How do we get food? I mean, where does it come? Because you look around. I mean, we're a pretty pathetic animal. No, you can look. Right? We're weak. We're slow. We have no claws. We have no fangs. How do we get food? You try running down a bison and biting into it. <laughs> or try standing up to a saber-toothed tiger. And yet, the saber-toothed tiger, last one I saw, was in a museum. And here we are, sitting in comfortable chairs, with leisure time to listen to a lecture, going to school and getting an education. We haven't dealt with saber-toothed tigers in thousands of years. How do we do that as a species? How do we survive? How do we get food? Yeah? Agriculture. Okay, agriculture. How did we get agriculture? Where did it come from? Agriculture is sophisticated. And for tens of thousands of years of human beings, we didn't even have it. How did we get it? Uh, killing other animals. Or... Killing other animals. How do we kill other animals? Again, we can't chase them down and bite into them. Corporation. Corporation. So we cooperate to do it. Absolutely. But even before cooperation, there's something that has to happen for us to be able to do this. By using our reason. Yeah, by thinking. By thinking. What makes us unique as human beings is that we have the capacity to reason. We have the capacity to think. So if we're going to cooperate, we have to be able to communicate. We have to be able to communicate about 
fairly abstract ideas like how do we strategize about running and maybe building a trap or maybe your group attacks from that side and we attack from this side to catch the animal because we see new ideas, right? Certainly, the next guy who discovers this, who sees this, maybe 10,000 years later, says, whoa, I can turn this into an industry. Call this the Bill Gates of 10,000 years ago. And he says, I can turn this into an industry. We can plant in rows and we can really cultivate agriculture. But he had to figure that out. And that's how you get an industry called agriculture. That's how you get mass production of food. Of food. food, none of us have the gene for food manufacturing. None of us have the gene for agriculture. The only gene we have is the gene that makes it possible for us to reason, to observe reality, to integrate the facts of reality, to learn and integrate in new ways, learn new knowledge, teach other people, communicate, cooperate through teaching other people. But at the fundamental core of human survival is one thing. Our capacity to reason. iPhones don't happen because somebody has a good gene. iPhones don't happen because somebody was raised in a good environment. iPhones don't happen spontaneously from all the other animals out there. That's what makes us human beings. It's our capacity to reason, our capacity to think. So when Ayn Rand talks about selfishness, when she talks about self-interest, what is the most self-interested thing that you can do? Well, if your capacity is in the thing that allows for human survival, if the thing that allows for human creation of values is reason, then if you care about yourself, then what's the most important thing one should do? What's the most important thing one should cultivate? It's your mind. It's your capacity to reason, your capacity to think. You got one life. The way to live it to the fullest potential is to use your mind to figure out what's going to lead to the most successful life possible. You get to shape your life. You get to shape your soul. You don't get to blame it on other people. You don't get to blame it on your genes. At the end of the day, it is your decisions, your free will, and your capacity to think that determines who you are as an individual. And for Rand, the number one value, what is a value? These are kind of terms we like to throw around, right? But what is a value? An idea we hold sacred to ourselves, but values are not just ideas, right? Uh, you know, um, I don't know. A Porsche could be a value to you, right? Uh, material things can be values, right? We, what, what is a value in the broader sense? Yeah. Uh, a guiding principle. A guiding principle at a certain level of value becomes that. Well, a value becomes that. But again, I value food. I value my iPhone. I wouldn't consider them guiding principles. They're values in ethics, where I think it's a, it's a guiding principle. We'll, we'll talk about what that means. But values generally are things that we act to gain or keep. It's things that we really care about, that we want. And in morality, values, moral values, are those abstract attributes that we want to hold, that we, that we care about, that are really, really important for our lives. For Rand, the most important value, the number one value, is reason. It's to think. It's to take your life seriously enough to think about what you're doing. And what does that mean, right? What does that mean to say think? Because we all have emotions, right? What about emotions? Should we follow our emotions? Should we follow our reason? Should we ignore our emotions? Suppress our emotions, maybe? Who cares about emotions? Where do emotions come from? Well, psychology. Yeah. Your thoughts. Yeah, so emotions come from your thoughts. Not always your conscious thoughts. And not always thoughts that you are aware of in a sense that they might have been thoughts you had when you were three. Right? Emotions come from conclusions that we've come to in the past that we're not always aware of, and they're automatic, quick responses based on those conclusions. So you see something 
that's scary. You don't even know why it's scary. You haven't had a chance to think about why it's scary. You feel fear. Why? Because at some point, you've automatized that that thing, a shadow, a dog, I, I'm scared of barking dogs, right? Whoa. Right? I think when I was a kid, you know, maybe a dog tried to attack me and I, dog's bad, you know, right? Those are the kind of things that cause you emotion. But emotions don't, they're not tools of cognition. They don't teach you about the world. They teach you about you. They teach you about your response to the world. So when we make decisions in life, should we use emotions? Should we use facts? Reason? Logic? Well, given that we don't exactly know where our emotions always come from, given that they're based on conclusions we might have come to a long time ago, I'd suggest that maybe we embrace emotions. Emotions are wonderful. We live through our emotions. We experience life through emotions. We're cool, right? But they're not decision-making tools. This is your decision-making tool, your reason, your ability to look out the world, figure out what's a fact and what's false, false or fake news, what's real, what's not. Use logic to figure out what is true, what is right, and act based on that. So reason means orientation towards facts. Now, if I'm oriented towards facts, let's take some of the claims that we made about being selfish earlier. Lying. So we said lying, stealing, cheating, right? Lying. Would lying be consistent with a self-interested life that was guided by, that placed its highest value on reason? Is reason and lying, are they consistent? Reason is about facts. What's lying about? Non-facts. The opposite of facts. It's about deception of facts. <laughs> And the person most important in life not to lie to is whom? Yourself. Because if you put garbage in, what are you going to get out? It's a computer science term. Garbage in, garbage out. If you put in nonsense into your mind, if you put in fakes, anything in there, what you're going to get as a result is not logic, it's not truth, it's not reason. So you want to make sure when you deal with reality, when you deal with people, when you deal with anything, that the facts are true, that they're real. You don't want to deal with lies. What about other people, right? Is it in your self-interest to lie to other people? It's sometimes easier. It's sometimes emotionally less stressful to lie than it is not to lie. But do you think that's a good strategy in life? How many of you lied in your life? I don't, I don't really want to know. And I suspect I know the answer anyway. Lying sucks. It's a bad strategy. Now, I'm a little older than you guys, quite a bit older than you guys. And I can barely remember what I did last week. Particularly given my travel schedule, I can't even remember what continent I was on last week. Now, imagine I lied about what I did last week. Now, instead of remembering one thing, I have to remember two. But it's more than two. Because I have to remember what I did last week who I lied to, who I didn't lie to. And you can add on to that. Why I lied to these people, I didn't lie to those. I mean, it's, whoa, blows my mind. It's way too complicated. I value my machinery, if you will. I value my reasoning. To lie is to deceive yourself. To lie is to obstruct your capacity, your focus, your ability to reason properly. It's too much work. It's too destructive. It's not in your self-interest. It's just a cheap way of avoiding reality, of avoiding sometimes the hard truths that need to be said. Lying's not self-interested. Lying's not altruistic. Lying's just stupid. It's just not good for you. It's just bad. And you can take all of these behaviors, right? and evaluate them based on the standard of reason. Now, what does one have to do other than think in order to survive? So we can think, thinking is great, but what else does one have to do in order to survive as a human being? If you took your life seriously, and you really wanted to, you know, first survive and then really thrive in the world, what would you have to do above and beyond thinking? 
What's that? Breathe. Breathe. Yeah, okay. Breathe is kind of automatic. So something you had a choice about. And important. Yeah. Uh, Adapt. Do we adapt to the environment as human beings? Interesting question. Do we adapt to the environment as human beings? Yeah, we adapt the environment to fit our needs. If we're cold, we build a fire. If we're really cold, we build a hut. If the hut isn't good enough because the window blow it down, we build it from bricks. And when we really get to it, we'll build skyscrapers. We change the environment to fit our needs. Again, makes it very different than any other animal out there that adapt to the environment. We adapt the environment to us. One of my, one of my concerns with environmentalism, you can ask me in the Q&A, is exactly this point. They want to undo that fact, the fact that we change the environment to fit us. They want us to leave the environment alone. Wait a minute. That's not how human beings survive. That goes against our nature to leave the environment alone. So what do we have to do? Think. And then act. We have to act. We have to produce. Food doesn't just show up. It doesn't just come from the grocery store. You have to work to make the money to buy the stuff from the grocery store. Or the farmer has to actually plant the seeds and whatever farmers do. I don't know. Don't have the gene for that. Right? Whatever they do, somebody has to do it. So second virtue. Virtue is an action necessary for attainment of your goal. Necessary for the attainment of a value is to be productive. Every human being should have the sense that they are producing and putting food on their table, that they can achieve something through the productive effort, their, their mind and their actions integrated to produce the stuff that goes on their table. So if you're productive and you succeed and you're challenged and you're pushed and and you, you, you really do well. What, 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 is that, what is the sense that you get about life? Confidence. There's a word, and I, I, I worry about using it, but hey, I'm used selfish, so I can use this one. Um, because it's so distorted today by, uh, in, modern, in modern usage, which is self-esteem. Right? Self-esteem means I belong on this planet. I'm good. I can cope. I can achieve. I can be successful. Life, fundamentally, is good and compatible with me. Self-esteem is an incredibly self-interested sense about the world. That comes primarily from the work we do. It comes from our successes. It comes from being challenged and being pushed and, and achieve something at whatever level we can achieve it. Everybody can achieve self-esteem. But it has to come from you and it has to come from your achievements. Production, work, is primarily where we get our self-esteem. I mean, I know people tell us all the time that what's really important to them, if you ask people, what's the most important thing to you? What do they always say? Family. Then why the hell do you spend so little time with your family? You spend most of your time doing what? As an adult, not you guys. Where do you spend most of your time? Working. We spend most of our life at work. Not because we have to. If all you needed was food and water and shelter, most people in, in, in modern society can work a lot less than they work. But we work a lot. Why do we work so much? If you're healthy and if you, hopefully, you get to choose your work and you know, you, you've done okay in life, then you do it because you love it. You do it because that's where you get your self-esteem from. You do it because that's where you're being challenged. You do it because that's where you're being pushed. So work, being successful at it, at whatever the work happens to be, at whatever level you're capable of, leads you to the self-esteem. What happens if you steal stuff? Going back to lying, stealing, cheating. Or if you cheat. What are you admitting to the world and to yourself? That you can't produce it. Somebody else produces it. You can use your muscle, not your reason, your muscle in order to take it away from them. But they produced it, and you know that they produced it. Self-esteem, down the toilet. You're not going to have any self-esteem. You're not going to have that confidence in a world. Now, one of the things I hate in modern movies 
is that in modern movies, almost all movies that had good guys and bad guys, who has fun? Always. Who's like a confident, happy, successful person? Gets the girl if they're male, gets the guy if they're a woman. Who is it? It's the bad guy. Always. And the good guy is usually divorced and miserable and hates his job. Ugh, and he has to be a good guy. Ugh, the burden of being a good guy. That drives me nuts. Because bad guys are the ones who actually suffer. Criminals don't have fun. Lying, cheating, stealing people are not happy. They don't have self-esteem. They don't like themselves. There's a famous case in the U.S. called uh, Bernie Madoff. Again, generations past. Bernie Madoff ran the largest pyramid scheme in history. $63 billion he stole. $63 billion. Now, do you think Bernie Madoff sat down one day and said, hmm, I wonder how I can be happy. I know. I'll steal my best friend's money. Nobody does that. Very few. Maybe some hardened criminals do that, but almost nobody does that. Bernie Madoff saw a pile of money, saw an opportunity to cheat, and he took it out of emotional desire. He didn't think it through because you know what happens with pyramid schemes? Always they collapse. And you get caught. So you never thought it through. Thinking is not an attribute of bad guys, crooks, thieves. They don't think. They are old. And was Bernie made of happy? Hey, he had $63 billion. How can you not be happy if you have $63 billion? Was he happy? Well, it's interesting because people interview him. Now he's in jail, right? He was caught. He's in jail. Um, not only was he caught, who do you think caught him? Maybe somebody knows who caught him. No, not a competitor. Competitors warned the authorities that he was doing a pyramid scheme, but the authorities couldn't catch him. Who caught him? Who figured it out and caught him and told the police, basically? His son. So his kids. And what happened? And his son a year later committed suicide. And today, Bernie made us in jail knowing his son committed suicide. And yet, he says that he's happier today in jail than he was before he was caught. He never enjoyed the money. Why? Because he had no self-esteem, because he constantly obsessed about when he was going to get caught. It was obviously he was going to get caught. Who would catch him? He was constantly lying to his best friends, constantly lying to his family. How can you live a life where you can't look people in the eye because you're lying to them? He had a horrible life. All because he didn't think. He acted on emotion. And usually... As you get older, you'll discover this. You probably know it already by now. You get into trouble when you follow your emotions and you don't think first. That's almost always the case in relationships, in school, in work, in almost everything. If you follow this and you don't think it through, that's when you get into trouble. So being self-interested is not about being a lying, cheating, stealing, whatever. It's about being a thinking human being. It's about using your reason. It's about thinking things through. It's about separating fact from fiction and focusing on reality and on truth and in exercising the muscle, the most important muscle we have, which is the brain. Is the brain a muscle? I'm not even sure if that's true. Anyway, whatever, right? The brain. That's what it means when Ayn Rand talks about the virtue of selfishness. She's talking about the virtue of using one's mind to pursue the values you choose for yourself based on the facts of reality. What will make your life the best life that it can be? Because you only get one shot. You only get one shot at this life. There's no second chances. As far as I know, there's no reincarnation. And even then, you're not guaranteed to come back as a human. You could come back as a cockroach. Bad stuff. Bad karma, right? So there's one shot. One life. It's yours. The whole idea is to make the most of it. And you make the most of it by using your reason, by focusing on reality, by thinking things through, by living and enjoying and having passion for the values that you figured out are good values, are things you should actually be pursuing. And I promised to talk about the implications to politics, so let's we'll transition. So what does that mean? What kind of life 
will, what, what kind of world do people who want to live for themselves, using their mind, not exploiting other people, but not expecting to be exploited by other people either, by treating other people based on what? Based on something called, that I may call the trader principle. The idea that if I'm going to interact with you at any level, spiritual level, material level, it should be a trade. I should get something. I should be better off because of the interaction. And you should be better off because of the interaction. I like to think of, of, of the idea of the virtue of selfishness as in terms of other people. That you want to maximize, you want to maximize your win-win relationships in life. You want to maximize the relationship in which you gain. But if somebody else is loses when you gain, you're not going to sustain the gain for very long. Lose, win-lose always turns into lose-lose. Now, if you don't believe me, try it with a friend. You know, set up a win-lose situation and see how long that lasts. So to be truly self-interested, you want to create these win-win relationships. You want to be able to use your mind. You want to go out there and experiment with life because you don't know exactly what works and what doesn't. You don't know exactly what values you want to pursue. You're young. The world is open. What kind of world would somebody like that want to live in? Well, what is the enemy? What do you think the enemy is of reason? What is the thing that makes reason impotent? That incap incapacitates reason? The reason doesn't know how to deal with it. Cannot deal with it. What's the enemy of reason? Yeah, force. Coercion. If I put a gun to the back of your head, there's no point in thinking. You just do what I tell you. If you're interested in survival, thinking now is out the window. It's irrelevant. The one thing that is the enemy of individual Success of individual reason, of thinking, of you know, of of, of achieving, of, pro of producing, is force. It's coercion. It's putting a gun to somebody says. It's authority that tells you what to think, and if you don't think what they say, you to think what happens to you. Well, if you're lucky, like Galileo, you go to house arrest. If Galileo had been born maybe 20 years earlier, they probably would have burnt him at the stake. Because that's what they did with people before Galileo who challenged the dogma, the authority of the time. So force is what we want to ban from human relationships because force cripples the mind. Now, how do we do that? How do we ban? Because we get into a community, we get into a society, and there are always going to be some bad guys. There are always going to be some people who think they can get away with stuff. There's always going to be a boonie made off, unfortunately who thinks they can get away with it, and who doesn't think, but just emotes. So one of the reasons, the only reason, really, when we get into a social context to create a government, is to ban the use of force. It's to have an agency, and a government is just, in my view, an agency, that basically has the monopoly over the use of retaliatory force. It does not allow us to engage with one another through fists. It takes the fist out. It takes the gun out. It bans the use of violence and fraud. Right? Fraud is a form of violence. From human relationships. It says you can do whatever you want. A good government. Says you can do whatever you want. You can live any way you want. You can value what you want to value. You can use your reason or not. But the one thing you cannot do is use violence against another person. And this idea of that being the purpose of government, who came up with it kind of first? Who is the guy who really formulated this? I mean, Hobbes, in a sense, but it's actually post-Hobbes because Hobbes doesn't come up. Hobbes doesn't believe in individual freedom, right? He believes in, in the state having authority, but it doesn't just use that authority to, uh, to, to use force to protect you. It uses that authority to coerce you. So who came up with the idea that the state should not? Max Weber. No, way before Max Weber. Plato. No, I wish Plato. Play the whole history of the world would be different. <laughs> Plato had thought of that. John Locke, thank you. John Locke, you know, one of your fellow countrymen, I guess, right? Or is, does, does he count? I don't know. Depends on where you are in, in Great Britain, I guess. Um, John Locke, 
The whole idea of individual rights, which Locke is not the first. There were some, some Dutch uh, thinkers that, that come up with this before Locke. But Locke is really the first to formulate and formalize it properly. What is the idea of individual rights? What do individual rights mean? It means you have what? You have freedom. Freedom to do what? What's that? Well, you whatever you want, but really in Locke's view, you have the freedom to use your reason to live your life based on your values that you deem necessary, that you deem necessary for your survival and thriving. Free of what? Because what does freedom mean? Freedom means the absence of? Force, coercion, domination, authority. The whole idea of individual rights is the idea of freedom from coercion. And we set up government in a proper society to help free us from that coercion, to mitigate that coercion, to be our objective enforcer of the law, of property rights, of that you can't use your fist against me. And of course, unfortunately, that government, those governments have usually, or what? They're the biggest coercers in the world. They're the ones who actually use the fist. They're actually the ones who coerce us and force us and so on. But the ideal of government is to be a government that does one thing and one thing only. And that is protect our rights, which means protect us from criminals and crooks and fraudsters and bad guys and leaves us alone so we can use our mind. We can use our reasoning to live our lives as we see fit. So a rational egoist, a philosophy of selfishness properly understood as Ayn Rand understood it, is compatible with only one system of government. And that is where government does this one thing. And it has a police force, it has a military, it has a judiciary. But that's it. Where the government doesn't coerce us, the government protects us. Its only function is to protect us. And that, of course, has multiple implications to how a government would run. And it certainly contradicts uh, how our government is running to a large extent, how our government runs today, where the government intervenes in every action that we take. Everything, almost is today regulated, controlled. You need permission from somebody who is wielding force, who has the capacity to wield force against any of us. Not a government that's limited, not a government that's restrained, but a government that is unlimited. This is much more Plato's influence. Somebody mentioned Plato before. This unlimited government is much more Plato. Because right? for Plato, well, Plato's you know, pretty down on democracy, but but he is big on the government should have a say in all of our lives and what we do. If you read the Republic, Plato's Republic, hey, who you marry, what profession, all of that is dictated by somebody above you. Because what does Plato not have respect for? Individual. Your individual capacity to reason for himself. See, I believe everybody can reason. I don't care what circumstances you're born under. I mean, unless you've really got some, you know, brain issue, right? Some 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 real incapacity. Everybody can. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what your color of your skin is, what gender you are. Any of those things don't matter. You've got a mind. You've got the capacity to reason. That's what makes you a human being. And therefore you know more about what you need, what is necessary for your success as a human being, for your thriving, for your achievement, for your survival than anybody else. Nobody else can tell you what your value should be. There are moral values, there are principles that I think are universal. Reason, productiveness, I think honesty, integrity, things like that. But how you apply those to your particular life is only you can make those decisions. Only you can choose them. And if the ideal, as with Rand it is, is to live a happy, successful, prosperous, wonderful life, then these are the ideas that make that possible. The idea of the state controlling our lives, regulating us, taxing us, coercing us, goes back to a different set of moral codes. If your life is not yours, if your right life belongs to the group, then the group gets to decide what to do with your life. 
If your life belongs to the state, if the primary is not you as an individual, but the primary is the state, then the state gets to tell you how to live. The state gets to tell you what business to open. The state gets to tell you how much to pay your employees. The state gets to dictate how much of the money you create, you get to keep. Whether it's through a process of voting or not through a process of voting, the group now has priority over the individual. So I often say that the problem we face today, those of us who believe in freedom, those of us who believe in a limited state, those of us who believe in capitalism, the problem we face today is not so much a lack of understanding of economics, and I'm sure some of that will come up in the Q&A. We've solved all the economic problems. I really, I mean, there have been so many great economists. There's no real open questions about whether free markets work from an economic perspective. There's no question of how to structure government in order to protect our rights. Founding Fathers of America figured that out pretty well. The system's broken today, but at the time, the division of powers and separation of powers and no, no one institution can dictate what is done was pretty brilliant and pretty amazing. If they had consistently applied it, it would have been fantastic and still would be, but we've lost that. It's not any of those problems. The real problem is the moral code we live under. As long as we believe that our life is not that important, that the primary is the group, that the primary is other people, that our purpose in life is to live for them, then the group gets to say. So the real revolution that's needed in our thinking is a moral revolution. It's to flip that. Individuals don't want paternalistic governments sitting on their shoulders and saying, don't drink that, don't eat that, can't start that business, oh no, don't ingest that. No, you want to be able to make decisions for yourself based on your own mind. And yeah, you're going to consult with experts. You're going to look for what is true and what is not, what are facts is what is not. But you don't accept authority. Individuals living for themselves, using their own mind, with self-esteem, don't accept authority. They don't accept the dictates of other people. They don't accept even the rule of the majority. Their life is sacred. Their life is theirs. And as individuals, we should be allowed to live that life as we using our reason, see fit to live it. Thank you. We have an awful lot of time for questions. I hope you're ready, Aaron. Well, I left a lot of time for questions because it's my favorite part. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you, Darren, for having that burning excellent. I think the potential criticism of Ayn Rand is that she has what one might say a very optimistic conception of what individuals are capable of. You mentioned three names, Galileo, Bill Gates, and Steve Jobs. But the simple fact of history is that these have always been exceptions to the rule. Most people simply can't think like Galileo or make money like Bill Gates or make innovations like Steve Jobs. But then it seems to follow that Ayn Rand's brand of heroic individual self-development, to give it a name, is only realistically appropriate for a few individuals and not for the many who, if anything, are often quite happy to follow what other people do and not think for themselves. So I was just wondering what you think about that. So uh, that's, a, that's a, 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 a critique that is often uh, presented about Rand's theory, but I think it's ultimately wrong. Um, I don't think people are happy to follow the dictates of the group. I think they do follow the dictates of the group. They're happy, I'm not convinced of, because I think people who follow the dictates of the group are rarely, if ever, happy. I think happiness requires that sense of self-esteem, that sense of confidence that one has in this world. And again, I don't think that's a question of ability. It's true. I'm not a Steve Jobs. I'm certainly not a Bill Gates, and I certainly am no Galileo, right? Any of those. But at whatever level you are capable of, you can be the best human being you can be. You can be the best bricklayer in the world. You can't, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny, but it's true. And people get pride out of doing a task, whatever the task is, however simple that task is, really, really well versus eh, skimming and not really doing it. Or worse, not doing the task and getting a warfare check. So give you three, three possibilities of the same person getting a warfare check, doing the task half-heartedly and, you know, just, just getting by, or doing the best job that you can in the simple task, right? Who do you think is happy of the three? Who do you think has pride that they're putting food on the table, comes home with a sense of accomplishment at the end of every day, 
only the person who's putting in the effort, who's making to the extent, again, that they can. And in the fountain, in United Nations fountain, in, there is an example of a, of a construction worker. There's an example of, there's, there's a wide variety of examples of people who are accomplished in whatever it is that they do, which doesn't necessarily require the Galileo's IQ or, or, or Steve Jobs' imagination and, 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 and passion. So the point is, again, everybody has the capacity to reason at whatever level you have. And exercising that reason, taking that seriously and being productive at whatever level you can be is what gives purpose to your life and what gives meaning to your life and I think makes it possible to be happy. Unfortunately, we tell poor people, and this is this comes from Plato, right? We tell poor people, ah, you don't have a hope. Forget it. You can't take care of yourself. We, big brother, we'll take care of you. Don't think for yourself because you can't think. You're too stupid. Here, we'll give you a paycheck. We'll take care of you. We'll tell you what to think. We'll tell you how to think. it. The philosopher king, think about Plato's. I mean, in many respects, the hit, uh, Rand makes this point, but a philosopher named Leonard Peikoff really articulates this. And there's a book called The Cave and the Light, which makes this argument. That Western civilization has been a struggle between two philosophers, Plato and Aristotle. And Plato basically says... You know, some people can reason. There were a few, right? The philosopher kings, and they can commune with this world of spirits, world of forms, to use Plato's terms, that only they can see. The rest of us, we're in a cave somewhere, and all we can see are shadows. We never see the real world. We never see the sun. We never see truth. But the philosopher kings, the philosophers, they see the truth. Now, if they see the truth and we don't, then who should we listen to? Them. We can't use our own reason because we can never find the truth. So we have to follow their instructions. And they are the elite who guide us in everything that we do. Aristotle, on the other hand, says, oh, wait a minute, Plato. No, 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 no. Every individual has the capacity to reason for himself. No, we don't live in a cave. We're all outside looking at the sun. If we choose to, if we choose to exercise our capacity to reason. And that, what I think what it boils down to is the choice. And I don't think the choice is an issue of IQ. I don't think the choice is an issue of ability. Um, we use Steve Jobs and those guys as examples because they are, the, the, you know, they are so brilliant and they achieve so much. And I think they make all of our lives better by so much. But all of us are capable of that, again, at the level that we're capable of. Yeah. Well, in the end of your talk, you uh, proposed something that was supposedly approximately not Washington State where the government is responsible for the judiciary that creates the military. Yes. Um, if that was to be undergirded by some form of taxation apparatus, would you not agree that to be consistent in the principle that you shouldn't be aggressed against a nation unless it's retaliatory, and that you shouldn't uh, initiate force unless it's retaliatory force, shouldn't the government not be able to initiate force against you that is also not retaliatory? Yes, I got this question uh, this after I always get this question, so it's, it's good. Um, yes, no, coercion is wrong. It doesn't matter how much coercion, coercion is wrong. So you cannot fund the government through coercive taxation. So the question is, how do you fund the government? And Ayn Rand has an essay on this in Capitalism, an Unknown Ideal, a book I highly recommend. And part of her answer is, look, <laughs> we're probably looking the decades before we get there. Let's just cut taxes to the level where that's uh, low, and then we can figure out how to make them not coercive. But, okay, but how would you do that? Well, I mean, a number of things. There are certain things the government does that you could charge a fee for service, where the government could charge a fee for service. And then the other, the other way would be a voluntary system, where people voluntarily provided funding. And I know Europeans always look at me funny when I say that, because you guys are all cynical. Um, and, and it's true, the, the welfare state creates cynicism. Um, but free people have no problem being charitable or, being, or recognizing the fact that when they're getting something, they want to write a check to pay for it. Nobody wants, if you're free and you have self-esteem, you don't want to get free stuff. You want to pay for what you get. So I'm a strong believer that such a small government, such a limited government, could easily be funded, actually would run surpluses every year, just by the fact that people would write checks and say, yes, I want to support my police and my, my government and my, my thing. But let's get there and then have the argument, is my view. Right? How will you exactly do it? Right? We're so far from it. Then we'll figure it out. We've got like 50 years at least, maybe 100 before we get there. We'll figure it out by then. Yeah. 
you mentioned earlier when you talked about environmental and environmental rights, obviously we get observations through an AI. Which is interested to hear your thoughts on that in Yeah, so I want to separate two things. I want to separate the concern with having clean air and clean water, which all of us, for very self-interested reasons, have a concern about that. We don't we don't want to pollute out, we want to be healthy, right? And the idea of environmentalism as an ideology. The ideology is primarily dominated by people who view nature as an intrinsic value, as a value external to human beings and what we as human beings value. And I think that is false. I don't think anything has a value except as a human being, right? A value to whom? Right? Values are something we as human beings act to gain or keep. Not something that has a value in and of itself. Nothing has a value in and of itself. So my view is, you know, um, the solution to most environmental problems are twofold. One is property rights. If you, if you have property rights over everything, and I mean everything, right, uh, uh, lakes and rivers and stuff like that, then we have a long tradition of common law and a long tradition of legal system that you can't dump your garbage in my backyard. Well, if my backyard includes the lake, then you can't pollute the lake. I sue you if you do, and there are clear consequences to that. Um, if you're polluting and I'm breathing it and I'm getting sick, again, I can sue you and get compensation and stop you from doing that. And if it's clear damage, the government can ban it in the name of protecting me because I'm physically being damaged. So I think most of the legitimate environmental issues are solved through private property and through the legal system of harm, the issue of, of, of real harm, right? So what's left? Well, I don't know. You like spotted owls and they're going extinct, right? And I don't like spotted owls, they don't taste good. Um, what do we do about spotted owls that are going extinct? Well, my view is, if you care about spotted owls, if you think spotted are important for some reason, whatever reason, right? Maybe. You think they're important for the ecosystem that provides whatever for human beings, or you just like spotted owls, they're pretty, whatever, right? Then buy a big forest and have some spotted owls on it. Just don't expect me to have spotted owls in my forest. It's mine. Um, so I always say with endangered animals, if you want some, buy some. But, you know, what's endangered for you might be a pest for me. The standard, in other words, is human life. The standard is individual human life. It's not nature. It's not the environment. And, and if just to put this in perspective, human beings in all of human history have never had a better environment than they have right now. The air is cleaner than it's ever been. You, you go to London, go do a time machine and go back to London, 19th century, where the what was in the streets of London in the 19th century? What? Well, smog is in the air. What was on the ground? What's that? Feces. Whose feces? Well, mainly horses, because that was the means of transportation. So they were pooping. You know, in Disneyland, when the horse poops, there's somebody in the back there to sweep it up and take it away. That didn't exist in London. Too many horses, too much pooping. But then, of course, there was open sewer because we weren't wealthy enough to build real sewer systems, right? So it was filthy. What about the cavemen? You think their air was clean? Why do why do uh, why do Europeans, Northern Europeans, drink beer? Do well, you know why we drink beer? Because water, water was so polluted that, polluted by what? By just feces and stuff, that beer was the safest thing to drink. Why did the Chinese drink tea? This is true. Why did the Chinese drink tea? Because it forces them to boil the water. Because the water was so polluted, was so sickening, that they figured out that if you boil the water, nobody drank water. Where's my bottle? Right? Look at this. Evian. I get it from France, from the spring. Pure, <laughs> clean, capitalism. I mean, no time in human history could you drink better and cleaner, healthier water than we do today. You can choose between Evian and Fiji. They have different <laughs> minerals in them. You can choose based on your profile, what you like and what you want. I mean, it's crazy, but it's wonderful. Um, we've never lived in a cleaner place. We've never lived longer. We've never. I mean, what was life expectancy just 250 years ago? You know, at the time of Locke, what was life expectancy during Locke's time or, or during Adam Smith's time or Hume's time? What was, what was life expectancy? Anybody know? What's that? 
Wow, you're living long if you're 50. 39. Look it up. 39. If you were lucky and lived in a relatively good place, right? Most children died before the age of 10. Over 50% of children died before the age of 10. Today, children don't die. Oh, oh it's very rare. It's, 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 it's hugely unfortunate because it, it, it's such a traumatic event because it's not our experience of life. We don't experience children dying. Um, we live to be what? You guys, your generation is going to live to be 100. I mean, I hope I'm going to live to be well into my 80s, maybe into my 90s. I mean, that's, wow, that's unthinkable. I mean, I believe that if biotech was unregulated, you guys would be living to be 150 or 200. I think, I think the knowledge, we're close to, to really extending human life dramatically if allowed to use our reason and do the work to investigate these things and do it. When has human life been better? We're richer. I mean, it's, we're so rich, we've lost any appreciation of what it means. You literally have to travel around the world to go to really, really poor countries to find people who lived like we did 250 years ago to appreciate a little bit how rich we are today. And I encourage everybody to do that. Go to Africa, certain parts of Africa. Go to Cambodia. Go to places just to, just to gain an appreciation of how rich we are because we really are amazingly rich. Imagine what life would be without running water. Nobody had running water 120 years ago. Imagine what life would be without electricity. Nobody had electricity 120 years ago. You, you, I mean, your generation is all global warming or whatever, right? All upset at carbon fuels, right? But carbon fuels make your life. I mean, this is one of the most amazing inventions in all of human history. We have electricity. We have automobiles. I flew over here on a Boeing that used up tons of carbon fuel. Life is made possible because of carbon fuel. We live in the best environment. Even if the Earth warms by three degrees, we're still living in the best environment we've ever had. And we're so rich that we can afford air conditioning, even in England, if it gets too hot. I mean, really. So that would be my, you've got to follow up on environmentalism? Just quick follow up. Sure. It's just, I'm sorry, we've got plenty of time, so I'm trying to get to all the questions. Yeah. It's just, especially in the last week, we're about, we live in the best environment. I find hard to disagree with, it. but there has at least been publishing lately in New Science that so that we are almost creating too good an environment for ourselves that yeah, yeah. we start to basically it's too good for us that we start to destroy basically yeah, anything. Yeah, else. we're all gonna die soon. Do you, yeah, yeah, so, so to me, this is a new millennial cult. I mean, look, <laughs> I mean, really. I, 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 no, no. I, 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 I'll give you this: every single generation believes that it is living at the end of times. Every single generation. There's always something. It's going to end tomorrow, right? I've lived long enough to remember a book by Paul Ehrlich that came out in 1968. Paul Ehrlich is still around. He's still a professor at Stanford, still well-respected within the environmentalist movement. And he declared in 1968 that in the 1970s, hundreds of millions of people in Europe were going to die of starvation. And the world was going to end as we know it. Um, a few years later, I remember the, the headline in the New York Times saying the earth is cooling and we were entering a new ice age and the world was going to end by the end of that decade, right? And every, 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 now species are extinct and they're going to wipe out all the species in the world and we won't have anything to, I don't know, eat or whatever. The, every few decades or every few years, really, there's a new thing to be afraid of. We don't take religious seriously enough to believe that, I don't know, Jesus is going to come back and, and, and we have the end of times that way. So we invent new ways in which we're going to have an end of time. But it's, it's, we, we're perpetually obsessed with the end of time. The world is not going to end. Human beings are unbelievably smart. If the globe is, is warming as it seems to be, then we'll figure something out. You know, air conditioning is not a bad solution. Um, Amsterdam, is, Amsterdam right now for hundreds of years has been below sea level. And Amsterdam is one of the most amazing cities in the world. And maybe the freest country, if you go back long enough, in, in, in the world with a, with a fabulous history. And they're below sea level. So you think we can't enrich America, figure out how to deal with sea levels rising? Of course we can. Just use your mind. Figure it out. And if we allow freedom of technology to advance, then we'll have the technology to deal with these things. So, again, every generation has the hubris to believe they're it. And if we don't do something, the world's going to end. And by the way, when you say you can't argue with the fact that things are good, 
but nobody thinks that way. And indeed, constantly, your generation in particular is, is taught that life sucks and it's terrible and you're the cause or your parents are the cause. And you should rebel against this world because life is so hollow. By the way, just one other point and then I'll go back to questions. How many people 250 years ago lived on less than $2 a day or less than $2 a day? In absolute terms, that, that is in, in inflation adjusted $2 a day. An equivalent of what would be today $2. How many, what percentage of the population? 98 is a pretty good number, somewhere between 95 and 98 percent. What percent of the population of the earth uh, lived on two dollars a day or less 30 years ago? 50, anybody else? What's that? 80. 30 years ago. 80, 50. So it was 30. It was 30. There's a UN numbers, so, you know, they're biased, but probably not in my direction, right? Probably the opposite. So 30%, 30 years ago. How many live below $2 a day today? today in the world we live in right now, how many people live on less than $2 a day? In the world! What's that? Okay, 20%, less than 20%. Anybody else? What's that? 12.5. Well, no, I know the answer, so you don't have to Google it. It's about eight. Eight. The UN estimates that by within 15 years, the amount of ex what's called extreme poverty under $2 a day would basically be zero. We've never lived in such good times. And yet, all we do is bitch and complain. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I have an observation and a question. Um, it first seems that you talk about the enemy of reason as force. Yeah. What I, it seems to me what, you, what you're really identifying is not force, but what, what is at the root is desire. Because the desire for my life makes me conform to force. And so, so it's not so much I'm afraid of force as I'm afraid of what the outcome of force might be, which is the loss of that which I desire. No, I, I don't think that's right. I think force is, is at, the, at the root, right? Force is a consequence usually of emotion, of desire, of other people. It's rather than reason. It's rare that people use force, initiate force, because they thought. It, that goes back to my Bernie Madoff example. But I do think force is the primary. It's It's... I'm afraid of a fist in my face. I don't want a fist in my face. I certainly don't want a gun pulled out at me and then I get to told, oh, I don't want the church authority telling me what to think and what not to think and what's okay for me to think and what's not okay for me at the threat of burning at the stake or death or something like that. So force is the antagonism to my freedom to think, to use my mind, to explore the world, to discover new truths. And, and if you put force, that's what constrains. So desire can be overcome. I have lots of desires. Some are good, some not so good, right? But I have the reason, I have the capacity to control my desires, to limit my desires. But if you pull a gun on me, the only way for me to respond is with force, unfortunately, right? And I don't want to do that, right? Because it places my life in danger. So, so my question, I yeah. thought that okay. about that okay. My question is, there are seem to be certain decisions that we're not able to make as individuals because they're so big that we sort of have to make them collectively. Yeah. That's how it seems. seems. So so my question on that is um, in the, the modern Europe yeah. particularly, is Hungary and Poland, are they being rationally selfish when it comes to migration? And are countries like Sweden the irrationally altruistic, and is that is that hurting? All right, you had to in immigration, huh? Um, I think they're all wrong. I think they're all irrational. So if Poland and Hungary was only dealing with immigration, then maybe you could say okay. But Poland and Hungary are also dealing with out-and-out -out racism. They're also dealing with nationalism. Uh, that is the elevation of state above all else. They're also dealing with censorship. Hungary, there is no independent press anymore. You know, Orban has basically taken over all the press. The same is true, or starting to be true, more so in, in Poland. They haven't quite got to Hungary's level, but they're moving in that direction. Uh, on the other hand, the reason Sweden has opened its borders and not only allowed immigrants in, but when you come and you get a check and you get housing, when Swedes can't afford housing, you get, a, you get housing. 
that's you're right. That's altruistic and that's that's selfless and that's that's wrong. So I think they're both wrong. Both the Hungary model, the Polish model, and the Swedish model are wrong. Uh, my attitude is again, it's 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 do away with the welfare state. And then if somebody wants to come to your country and is willing to work, then great. I think I think immigration is a net positive. If it's not an immigration to come and get the welfare check, and you're not giving the welfare check. But for example, a lot of the immigrants who came into Germany are not allowed to work, even the ones who want to work, for like a year. Right? That's absurd. Right? So if you want to come in to work because you're coming to make your life better, welcome. And if we in the West say, this is how you have to live. These are the standards. These are the laws. This is the culture. This is the civilization. You have to adapt. It's the old American melting pot. I'm a big believer in the melting pot. You know, we keep the best of your culture. We dump the lousy parts of your culture. Because some cultures are not that valuable. Right? So, but... In order to do that, and I know you're not supposed to say some cultures are not that valuable. Some cultures are downright evil. I'll say that, right? Not all cultures are the same. Some cultures are pro-human life. Some cultures are anti-human life. And if you're coming to a pro-human life culture, you better adapt our culture. At least at this minimal level. Right? So if we have the self-esteem to declare reason, productiveness, a superior to anything else, then I don't think immigration becomes a problem. I think immigration is a problem because we're so weak that we don't uphold our own values. And I think the West, again, is an accident of history. I don't think it's genes. I don't think it's color of skin. But it's an accident of history. We inherited the greatness of the Greeks. We inherited these ideas of reason, of, uh, uh, you know, of science, of individualism. And we need to live up to them. And if we live up to them, Bring in the immigrants. Great. I mean, I love people. So, you know, and, 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 and I, you know, it doesn't matter to me where you're from or what the color of your skin is or anything like that. What matters at the end of the day is how you live and whether you're willing to respect the primacy of reason. All right. We're going to go through this group and then go back there. I'll try to make my answer shorter. Yeah. Uh, what would you say, um, in your opinion, are, are there any limits on the use of retaliatory force? So, for example, say between individuals or between um, states, and would you say there are like, any, what, what means, if any, are like too far? Well, I think, I think certainly individuals shouldn't be retaliated. This is why we have a system of law. So if somebody attacks me, certainly on the spot I will defend myself. But I'm not going to go chase the guy who attacked me. That's the job of the police. That's why we have a separate entity that is responsible for each other to force. And, and for the police, there has to be a level of proportionality. That is, there has to be a level of what is the threat, what is the crime. So you don't execute, you don't give the death sentence to a pickpocket, right? Um, but you might to a murderer, although I'm not a big advocate of the death penalty because I think too many mistakes are made. But, you know, you, you might be. So there's a certain proportionality in terms of that. I think war is different because war is about death and destruction, right? You don't go to war over a pickpocket. But if somebody really wants to kill you and your only means is to kill them first or to kill them in the process of battle, then I don't, then I think you have to win and you have to win quickly and you have to minimize casualties in your end. That's your responsibility. So I'm an advocate of you do what is necessary to win when it's a self-defense. I'm not an advocate of going to war for the sake of going to war for the expansion or for anything like that. But when it's self-defense, you go to war to win and get it over with. Yeah. Um, you said that we've only got one life and we have to live it to the best of our ability to do yes. so. But what if there's a government getting in the way of you doing said <laughs> things? You, you said at the end that we should rely on a revolutionary change of society. Yeah. But then you answered another question by saying that could take 100 years. Yeah. We're already 20 years into our life. We can't wait another 100 years or we will be dead. Is it not permissible to use force to achieve that state if it's for the greater good of every single individual in the world? So what you're saying, is it appropriate to, to, to launch a revolution yeah. for the sake of freedom like the Americans did in uh, towards you Brits? I think it is in the right circumstances. So I'm not against revolution, uh, armed 
revolution, but I don't think the time is right for two reasons. I think as long as we have the freedom to speak, then reason is our means to try to convince our fellow human beings about a better life and how to live that better life. Um, and this is why I think of all the issues in the world today confronting us, free speech is the most important. There is no more important issue than free speech. Because if you can't speak, you can't use reason, you can't debate, then all you're left with is a gun. All you're left with is a revolution. So I think the priority needs to be to speak, to <coughs> argue, to persuade. That's what I do. That's why I do it. And it's why I think the whole deplatforming, the whole uh, 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 inability of some people to speak, even people like the spies, they have to be allowed to speak because it, once we restrain some people's ability to speak, we'll restrain other people's ability to speak. There's no limit to that. And then we're back in the Inquisition. And that is an awful place to be. And, and Europe right now has does not have free speech. And it is a real problem. And as that goes away, you will see more and more people resort to violence. Because if we can't communicate by reason, all that's left is a gun. So I think as long as we have that, we should do it. The other issue is can you win? Which is an important one. And you can't. Not today. There are too few of us. And the other party has nukes. <laughs> I mean, the equivalent, right? It's, they have armies, they have tanks, they have, they have big guns. And so to do it to lose is not, you know, sometimes it's, 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 if, you, if, if you're enslaved, if you're truly enslaved, then it's, it's, it's sometimes better to die, and fight, try to fight for your freedom and die than not have ever fought before, not have ever fought. Give me liberty or give me death is real. But we are free enough today to be able to use argumentation to try to change the world. And that, that's my view. And again, that's why freedom of speech is so, so important. Because when we lose that, chaos break, will break up. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the talk. One of the most infuriating things about reading Nazi Shrug is listening to the criticism leveled against Ayn Rand. Yes. And, uh, and I want to ask you about the criticism that mo I most often hear, which is the elevation of both James Taggart and Dagen Taggart. And they seem to think that Ayn Rand is doing it in her books. At least that's the... What do you mean the elevation of them? Well, basically, they think that Ayn Rand proposes both as equally moral paths. Or just like... The, I don't know what book they read. No, that's the exact thing. But that is my question. Do you think they actually have, first of all, read Ayn Rand? Or do you think it's malicious that they're trying to, like, miss... I have actually life? never heard that particular criticism. I've heard lots. But that one I haven't heard. But look, James Taggart is the villain in the book. One of the villains in the book. And he has his job because of his family not because of his ability. And Dagny, by the way, the first female executive who runs a railroad in world literature. So uh, if, if, if you value the idea that women can do anything, Ayn Rand you know, was at the forefront of this in 1957, writing a book about a woman who runs a railroad. Pretty amazing. She is there because of her ability. And she is a vice president while he is the president because he's a man and because he is the eldest son, right? He is the he, he inherited it, and because the board of directors and society are weak and collectivistic and, and don't value talent and ability that Dagny represents. He's the villain, she's the hero of the book. I mean, there are other villains and other heroes, but in that, so no, they're not being elevated together. One is, and one gets destroyed, not to give the book away too much, and one achieves everything she dreamt of achieving, or, or is about to, at the end of the book, achieve everything she dreamt of achieving. So. So the, the good guys win, the bad guys lose in, in Atlas Show. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious as to your position on a specific issue. Yeah. And it's the one of the headscarf. Because uh, it seems to me that many people, uh, so in France, for instance, the headscarf is yeah. for the place. Yeah. And that is um, kind of explained by the fact that the scarf is seen as a, an act of coercion. And so the state is protecting from coercion. Yeah. But on the other hand, people say that wearing a headscarf is a choice, in which case um, the state is you basically limiting your, your yeah, life. so it's, to me, it's, it's fairly simple. If it's a choice, it's fine. I, you know, I believe in freedom of religion, and if it's a religious symbol, or if it's a whatever symbol it is, right? And look, headscarves are worn by Muslim women, but very religious Jewish women wear headscarves, and, and in some Christian sects, women wear headscarves. So now, if it truly is the case that there is coercion placed, where, where, where let's say a husband or father or whatever, 
is literally forcing and the woman is objecting, right, and she doesn't want to do it, then yeah, then it's forced and then the state has a right to intervene. Not about the head scout, but because there's actual violence involved, there's actually coercion going on. So no, I don't believe in the state should ban religious symbolism. I think certain religious acts should be banned. I think whether it's female genital mutilation or male uh, circumcision, I, I think, I think, I mean, female genital mutilation is far worse, but both are acts of violence against a young child, which should not be permitted. Yes. Yes. How have we gone from small government to big government since uh, over the past 300 or 250 years? Yeah. Would you say the main driving factors behind um, coercion and the collective? Plato. <laughs> um, it's all about ideas. It's all about ideas. So. Um, it's actually not Plato, it's Kant, it's Immanuel Kant. So just a, yeah, <laughs> you guys knew I would say that. Um, look, there, there basically was an enlightenment that came very close to answering the key questions about individualism, about reason, and about government. And then there was a counter enlightenment. There was an attack on the enlightenment, I believe, by Rousseau and Kant and their followers, whether it's, it's uh, Hegel, Schopenhauer, ultimately Marx and, and every intellectual since then, including Nietzsche, were all counter enlightened. They rejected reason at properly understood. I mean, Kant talks about reason, but it's not the same reason as I think uh, the Enlightenment understood it to be. Um, Hegel, Hegel actually believes that contradictions are part of the world. The essence of life is contradiction, right? And contradiction, if that's the case, then logic is out. Logic is the art of non-contradiction identification. It's about dismantling contradictions, doing, you know, discovering that there are no contradictions. So the whole German Romantic school is, I believe, responsible for the undercutting of the Enlightenment principles. And I believe that Ayn Rand is part of that Enlightenment. She completes much of what the Enlightenment started, uh, both in epistemology and the theory of knowledge and primarily in the theory of ethics. She takes Locke's work and, and many of the philosophers at the time, and I think completes it, right? And, and provides answers to a lot of the questions that those German romantics were challenging the Enlightenment on. Right. Um, and I think, so I think it's a, it's, it's a battle between those two forces. At the end of the day, we, to the extent that we're free, are still children of the Enlightenment. We're still products of the Enlightenment. You know, the fact, the fact this is a product of the scientific revolution and Enlightenment thinking. It's the idea of reason, right? It's the idea of the superiority of the individual. Those are, that's, that's what Enlightenment thinking was about. The collectivistic anti-reason forces that came about after the Enlightenment basically have fought against that, and they've managed to cripple our ability to create iPhones. Right? We're still flying basically the same airplane we flew in 50 years ago. There's been no innovation in airplanes and automobiles and a bunch of areas. Because government has restricted those, the one area it hasn't restricted is technology, where we're relatively doing well. Right? But everything that the government has touched is crippled by that touch. You should be living to be 200, but the government is all over biotech, so you're not. So is right. that a case once the government starts pushing the doors all over? Well, no, because it's not all over, you know, we're still going to fight. But it's a case where once you challenge and once you question and once you reject the idea of reason, and once you reject the primacy of the individual and the individual being sacred, sacred in the secular sense, once you reject those two pillars of what I think Western civilization is and what I think or what enlightenment thinking was, then nothing else you do matters. Then government will encroach, the, the collective will encroach. Today, we're at the level of a tribe. America's breaking up into little tribes. Europe is breaking up into little tribes. You know, my ancestors belong to this tribe, so I'm going to create my own little country of 400,000 people. Really? Um, so, you know, it, 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 this balkanization, this mentality of ethnic purity, uh, which is so destructive to human reason and to the idea of individualism, that is inevitable once you reject reason and individualism. And that's what we're seeing the world gravitate towards. So it's not that government stepped in, it's that the ideas opened the door wide open for government and government stormed in and is still storming in because we don't have the ideas to challenge it. And my job, your job if you wish to accept it, is to challenge those ideas and fight on the side of freedom, on the side of individualism, on the side of reason. Our job is to save the enlightenment. It's to resurrect enlightenment thinking. 
I think in the form of Ayn Rand, because I think she's the best representative of that thinking. But if you don't want to buy into everything Ayn Rand, well, fine. But, you know, I hope you, at the very least, buy into what Locke wrote, right? So, so th those fundamental ideas of individual liberty and of, of the efficacy of human reason, those are the key to human success. Thank you, Dr. Brooke, uh, finally glad to be speaking to myself. Um, I will bar, I won't bar into one of the reasons I came to that because I hope I can find this on the uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to be one of these people around who goes on the phone and they're buying like to respond because I've been dying to get an actual objective philosopher to respond to what I'm saying. Sure. Um, while I agree with you on objectivism on some topics, including the power of capitalism, I enjoy Graham's works on romantic realism, for example. Yep. And I have a sort of starry eyed romanticism for the Aristotelian view of happiness, which objectivism promotes. Yep. Um, the issue I have with objectivism is its epistemology. So, as we all know, random objectivism has an epistemology called promotion of rationalism, which I think backs up or trumps its sort of ethics, its egoism. Yep. Um, now, while this is all good and well, as reason is, in essence, an important part of what it means to be human, it is not all it means to be human. Uh, like my friend Matthew said earlier on in the QA, most humans are not capable of rationalizing on the plane, say, Bill Gates and Galileo. Yep. This is due to a variety of factors, some biological, some psychological, and even environmental. Uh, most humans are also inherently irrational, emotional, or not so tribal, or as the word we have to use, collectivistic. Yeah. Um, this is the reason why I'm no longer inherent to objectivism, is because, in my opinion, it fails to recognize the full state of man as an irrational being, as well as ignoring and sneering at his natural desire to be part of something bigger than himself, as well as to adhere to his own group preference. I still want to be an objectivist. I think it was quite a marvelous philosophy, really. You know, when I read out of trouble when I was 16, like you, you drew me in. Um, but Rand's epistemological worldview, which backs their ethics, is in essence ignoring the natural, irrational, and full state of man, and is thus too idealistic and even utopian to buy tastes. Um, the conservative commentator Ben Shapiro says that facts don't care about your feelings. I would say that feelings don't really care about your facts. Uh, and again, thank you, and much say in response to a pessimistic ex objectivist like myself. Um, <laughs> you're too. Platonic and Christian. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, I don't believe in the in the thesis of the fallen man, and that is that that people are inherently any of the things that you listed there, that they're inherent. And I think there's plenty of evidence. There's plenty of evidence that when people are left free, when people are respected as individuals, they live up to that, not down to that. Um, I think you can find evidence all throughout history of people being good and people thinking. I think maybe the best evidence of that is, I mean, I can think of a few places, but, but, but certainly the United States in the 19th century post, you know, put aside slavery. And of course, the war was fought, so slavery then went away. People fought to end slavery. That's pretty cool, right? Um, and people built something. Not just the geniuses built something. The genius made it possible. You can't do it without the geniuses. But people engaged with the world. People went out and built farms in the middle of nowhere because they believed in something and they wanted something and they wanted to make the best life they could. They got on ships from little shtetls in Eastern Europe to Irish farmers you know, who, who were starving to death and went and made something of their own life. They didn't rise up and, and steal stuff from people. They actually built a life for themselves. Now again, they're not, they're not, there were the imperfections, there were bad things that people did and all that, but generally, if you look at the scope of history, particularly the last 250 years, I wonder at, at, at man's ability to be rational. And this is when they're not taught it. This is in spite of the fact that we try to collectivize them and socialize them, and, and where religion is so dominant as, as a factor, again, particularly in the United States, which I think teaches irrationality and the opposite of all these virtues, right? So, so if, if you, you know, and in spite of all that, you, you, I don't know, I go to, I went to, you know, first time I went to Hong Kong, it just blew my mind. Seven and a half million people live in this thing, on this rock, in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing there. There's no natural resources. And it's skyscrapers and people are busy producing and creating stuff. These are rational people now. Are they fully rational objectives? No, of course not. But to the extent that they understand the rationality, what it demands from them, and that their life depends on it, they are. Now, this is without an education, without being taught anything, with an educational system that goes counter to all our ideas, all my ideas. And people are still that good. And I meet people every day, all over the world. I travel, I'm on this trip, I'll be in seven countries, right? 
all over the world, all cultures, religions, and you find amazing people everywhere, rational people. Now, are they fully? No. Why are they not fully? Well, we've never taught them how to be. We've never expected it from them. We, you know, and again, it's it, to a large extent you get what you expect from people. You know this with kids, right? So, you know, our intellectual leaders are telling people, particularly today, you should rank yourself, you should consider yourself a member of a group, and then you should think about how oppressed that group is, and you should rank your importance in life based on how oppressed your group happens to be. I mean, God. <laughs> Saying that as an atheist. You know, God. <laughs> really? I mean, that's a horrific way to think about life. So, everything we're teaching people is how not to be rational, how to belong to groups, how to be a collective. And in spite of all that, people do amazing things. So, and, 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 and again, I don't consider poor, rich, smart, stupid. I mean, stupid in terms of IQ. I don't think those are characteristics. I know, I know people with low IQ who are amazing human beings. I know people with high IQ are the worst type of human beings. And the same with race, and say any characteristic you want that's, that you're born with is irrelevant to the choices you make. So imagine a world in which we had a good educational system. Imagine a world where we didn't categorize you immediately into some group and, and how oppressed you are. Um, imagine universities that taught you, and, and schools, from primary school, that taught you how to think, how to be a critical thinker, not what to think. But how to think. I mean, we're just scratching the surface. Like, freedom, in a sense, was invented 250 years ago. The product has been amazing. Human beings have been on Earth as human beings, as fully Homo sapiens, I don't know, a few hundred thousand years. 250 years versus a few hundred. I mean, we're just at the beginning of a long journey. I mean, I hope many of you live to see the journey continue significantly into the future because of innovation in healthcare. But again, this goes back to this idea, every generation thinks it's so important it's going to end the world. I mean, we're not, to, to evaluate human rationality, when we just discovered it, we're just not ready. It, it, it takes time, it takes education, it takes absorbing, it takes a long time. Think of how long it took Christianity to dominate, and that was all based on emotion, and it fed into the existing culture. We're asking you to Dump everything you believe in, everything you've learned for the last 2,000 years and accept a new ideology. It's going to take a little while, and, and people are going to have to live up to it. But in my mind, people are certainly capable of it, and I see signs of their capability every single day. I see people who, are, who don't do you know, for a while, don't do anything in their life and just wander and, you know, look like they're completely lost. And, and then, then suddenly they, they decide, no, I'm going to make something of myself, and they do it. And they're not Steve Jobs. The middle managers, but they do something and they make they make something really meaningful of their lives. And I know people are the opposite who start out great and everything's great and they make a choice. It's about human individual choices, and I, I don't I don't give up on that. I don't see any reason to give up on that. And Ayn Rand's epistemology, which you can read in Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, which is a little book. When I had kids, one of the things that amazed me, you know, she has a whole theory of how concepts are formed, and said, when I saw my kids doing it. It was like, whoa, she was right, right? <laughs> it's amazing that, that how right she is when it comes to epistemology. Still, still. <laughs> I don't think, well, I, I think, again, your generation is way too pessimistic. And I think you're being, that pessimism is cultivated in you uh, through a variety of different means. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Final question, by the way. And yeah, this will be the final question because I have to run for the train. I was just wondering in more practical sense, your idea of a small state. Yes. No, no. I mean, a central bank is one of the dumbest things the government does. Um, so we understand, for example, and, and we've got a lot of experience about this, that if the government sets the price of bread, that it will be a disaster. I mean, nobody thinks the government should set the price of bread, right? Because they'll either set it too high and what will happen? Nobody will want to buy the bread and we too much bread and we'll trash it. Or they'll set it too low and then everybody will want to buy the bread and, they, and the suppliers won't want to supply the bread. So we know this from Economics 101. We know supply and demand in the marketplace works wonderfully well for bread. Right? The Soviets tried setting prices for bread, didn't they? So let's do this experiment. Let's take the most important price in the entire economy and the most important product, if you will, in the entire economy, money and interest rates. 
And let's have a bunch of central planners set that. Guess you're what you're going to get. They're going to set it too high, which is going to cause recessions. They're going to set it too low, which is going to cause bubbles, which ultimately cause recessions. And it's going to be completely messed up. They're going to distribute. They're going to put too much money sometimes. Too, but there is no right amount of money because you're taking supply and demand out. Just like there's no right price of a central planner setting for bread because you're taking the real supply and demand out. And Hayek is, is a genius here in, in explaining the informational function of prices and how prices convey information and how this wondrous process of price adjustments, of price changes, conveys the appropriate information to the entire economic system so that just enough bread appears in the grocery store just when I walk in at just the price that I'm willing to pay for. I mean, grocery stores are truly magical things. I mean, magical, I'm, I'm being, uh, you know, facetious, but they're truly amazing things because the stuff you want is almost always there at a price you're willing to pay for it. And for those of us who maybe lived under a little bit of socialist, those of us old enough to remember Britain as more socialist than it is today, that never used to be the case. You often went into a grocery store and the stuff you wanted wasn't there because the government was manipulating prices and distorting. So yeah, central banks uh, are one of the first things that should go. Money should be issued by private issuers, banks primarily, based on something, I believe gold or whatever the market assumes. And it, it, you know those adjustments should be made to supply and demand in the marketplace, just like the price for bread. I don't think there's any difference. Money is too important to be monopolized by government. Thank you all.